In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is finished. As I said yesterday, without Good Friday, Easter is nothing but a time of flowers and new clothes, a figment of sentimentality, a ceremony without true meaning. Easter without Good Friday is what the great 20th century theologian and martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer defined as cheap grace. So to pick up where I left off yesterday, what is cheap grace? Cheap grace is forgiveness without recognition of sin. It is celebration without understanding of grief. It is life without acceptance of death. Last night we stripped away, well, yesterday afternoon, all of the trappings, the magnificence and glorious symbols of our Lord from this church. And I spoke of remembrance, anamnesis. Today we continue that theme of anamnesis as we remember that Jesus died a cruel and horrible death, having given everything he had, all for us, his body, his blood, and his love. Today on Good Friday, we remember the cruelty, the shame, the pain of the death he died for us. We remember the humiliation of the crucifixion. We remember the crown of thorns he was forced to wear, the mockery he endured in the hands of his captors, the Roman guards. Let us also remember how he was abandoned by those whom he loved so dearly, his closest friends. I promised last Sunday when I compared the different gospel messages of the Passion, that on Good Friday I would address the Gospel of John. John's version of the Passion is used in all three of our lectionary years exclusively on Good Friday. John, writing in the early second century, offers a more complete vision of royalty than even Matthew does. For John, Christ's royalty is tangible and real. It is here and now. It is true divinity dwelling among us. God's Word, capital W, His one true and only Son, comes into the world, becomes flesh, and dies a human death. Yet, there is a strong sense of glory, even joy, because there is hope. John's message is clear throughout his entire gospel that Jesus is the divine Son of God. This contrasts greatly with the veiled secrecy that we see in Mark. John's portrayal of Jesus as true divinity differs from the other evangelists. Jesus is in control throughout the entire passion narrative. He is fulfilling his destiny according to God's master plan, even while enduring a harsh death by crucifixion. It is in the Gospel of John that Jesus utters his last words of, It is finished. For the pre-Easter Jesus, it was finished. The cruel, humiliating, and painful death that he had endured was now over. The ultimate sacrifice had finally come to an end. But what was Jesus saying with these, his last words? Various biblical translations may offer slight differences of 
It is consummated. It is accomplished. It is achieved. It is finished. What is finished? What is it? Is Jesus speaking of his life on earth? Because it was finished. Is that what it is? No. Jesus is speaking of something entirely different, brought about by that precious sacrificial death. Jesus is speaking of your salvation and mine. It is now secure. It is completed. We have been saved by that one beautiful and supremely unselfish act. There is no greater thing that a man can do for his friends than to lay down his life. This is what Jesus taught the disciples and what he is teaching us. Jesus dies on a cross for our sins and we are all asked to do something. All we have to do is pick up our own cross and follow him. The service of Good Friday as it appears in our Book of Common Prayer consists of three parts. The liturgy of the Word, the veneration of the cross, and Holy Communion from the Reserved Sacrament. Today, we remember that awesome symbol of our salvation, the cross. Let us take a moment just to look at some different crosses and their different devotional applications. Medieval crosses, often depicting the suffering of Christ. There are plain crosses, sometimes they're made out of metal. Wooden crosses, some of which are adorned with the Corpus Christi, the body of Christ hanging on the cross, such as that one, or the one on the wall in the parish hall. These are typically not shrouded or removed from the church. Why is that? The body of Jesus is a constant reminder of the agony of his death on the cross. There are various triumphant versions of the cross, elaborate crosses, covered throughout Lent, removed for today. They're simply too pretty, not real enough, not painful enough. Dare we assume that on a day like today, we represent cheap grace? There are those that are encrusted with jewels, the Christmas Rex that shows Christ in magnificence on the cross. There's even a scene depicting Jesus coming down from the cross in triumph. Very post Vatican II Roman Catholic. No matter what kind of cross it is, they're all powerful. A priest who you know very well, who was my spiritual advisor in seminary, used to like to define sanctification as ever crawling towards the cross. It is customary to venerate the cross in some fashion today. When we have sung the anthems and the solemn collects are over, the wooden cross will be brought in to the words of, this is the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. To which we respond, Come, let us worship. These verse rules and responses are in your bulletin. You don't have to memorize them. The deacon does. After the cross is stationed in front of the altar, all 
will be invited to come forward. There are many traditions and differing ways to venerate the cross, and the rubrics of the Book of Common Prayer make provisions for any and all. You may simply kneel or sit in your pew and prayerfully consider Jesus' death on the cross. Some may choose to genuflect three times as they approach this awesome symbol of the power of Christ. Some may even elect to prostrate themselves. I used to. You may, as is the custom of the sun, kiss the cross. Don't be overly concerned health-wise. In a more modern-day custom, the deacon will wipe the cross off with hand sanitizer so you don't get sick. And while this is occurred, our choral voices will be singing the hymn Stata Mata Dolorosa, the dramatic song of Mary keeping vigil over the cross and her dying son. Whatever you choose to do, please do not feel pressured to do anything you're not comfortable doing. But do please take a moment to contemplate not only the humiliation of such a death, but also the awesome power of the redemptive work of Jesus as he dies for our sins so that we may live. The final part of the service is the Holy Eucharist reserved overnight in the chapel at the altar of repose, consecrated yesterday in the Monday Thursday service. On this day, the only day in the church here on which the Holy Eucharist cannot be celebrated in its full and complete form. There will be no words of institution, no emphasis, another Greek word, when the priest, God's minister, invokes the power of the Holy Spirit to change the very substance of the bread and the wine to contain within themselves all sweetness, the presence of Christ. There will be none of this because this is good Friday.